So I'm a really crap storyteller. In fact, I'm so crap, it's literally killing people. I grew up in Oxford, which is arguably one of the literary centres of the world. It's where Wind in the Willows was born. It was where Lord of the Rings was born. It's where Alice in Wonderland was born. Hence my regional Oxford accent. Not only were there amazing authors there, but there were also incredible musicians, dancers, illustrators. And my favourite books as a child was Aesop's Funky Fables, because it was illustrated by my favourite artist, Corky Paul. Now, Aesop was a slave-come-storyteller who has been attributed with writing over a hundred fables. And fables are just short stories that have some sort of moral at the end. It's a really good parenting tactic. You could be like, Maxine, just, just be patient, take it easy. Or you could tell me a story about kind of complex, interpersonal, anthropomorphic dynamics between a hare and a tortoise and a misaligned nap, and before you know it, I'm taking life pretty chilled and being a patient person. We all know the importance of storytelling. We're a self-selecting crowd here in the fact that we've come to a TEDx. We know that stories are super important from educating a child to changing the way a nation thinks. So, now that I'm sort of grown up and a half fully fledged adult, society tells me it isn't acceptable for my dad to read me bedtime stories. So I'm now a serious, slightly nerdy storyteller. I'm a data scientist. And I take massive, massive data sets in healthcare, specifically from the NHS, and try to still tell stories from them. I try to find threads, narratives, trends, exceptions to trends, counter trends. It's the best job in the world, and it is super exciting. And unlike Herb, in academia, you do not get paid half a million, unfortunately. But my stories aren't super exciting. My stories don't have a cool moral at the end. My stories end with things like, the area under the receiver operating curve is 0.98. You're not exactly on the edge of your seats right now, are you? And that's a massive problem. We have an epidemic of terrible storytelling when it comes to academia. And data scientists are maybe not known for their eye contact and coherent sentences, but it's so important to tell proper, proper stories when it comes to data science, and more importantly, to tell proper stories when it comes to data science and health. The NHS is one of the greatest institutions in the world, and it's sitting on an absolute goldmine of information. And healthcare is completely changing as a result of the data that we potentially have access to. But because of these terrible stories we tell, we don't have public support. The result of that is it has taken me years, literally years, to get access to some of this data because it's so tightly regulated. When you get access to the data, it's often so broken up, you can't even make sense of it. Or worse, you just sit and wait and never get access to the data. But actually, it's even worse than not having public support. Actually, you don't know that I have access to it. Less than 20% of you know that people like me, researchers exist, and people like me are looking at your health data on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's take a step back. I think that I couldn't have said this a year ago, but we now have a pretty good understanding about what is happening with our data. You might not have known what GDPR was a few months ago, but boy, you knew on the 25th of May when your inboxes were full of messages that basically looked like they were from a needy ex-boyfriend. Please let not this be the end. I want to stay in contact. You're like, please no. But we're starting to understand that actually there are people out there using our data for ways that hadn't really occurred to us. For many of you, it wouldn't have occurred to you that when you go and walk into your GP surgery and you sit down and, I don't know, talk about your sort of latest niche food intolerance, and they're typing away, writing, you know, hypochondriac, drama queen, drop-down menu, <laughs> that that information is being piped locally, regionally, nationally into some really big data sets so people like me can then go and analyze them. But we're quite complex creatures when it comes to our relationship with that data, who gets to use it, how they get to use it, and when they get to use it. And that's what makes this whole landscape really tricky in order to tell the right story. So I've distilled down into some two metrics. What is it about data that means that we've got these odd inconsistencies, which makes it quite difficult to tell the right story? So on the vertical axis, we've got trust. And on the horizontal axis, we've got personal benefit. And to cut this long story short, we're basically all quite selfish when it comes to our, pro our relationship with data. So let's cut this whole space into four and take an example. 
So you're very likely to share your personal information with your own doctor if you're going to personally benefit. If you are allergic to penicillin and your doctor's about to give you penicillin, you sure as hell is going to tell them that you've got penicillin, um, you're allergic to penicillin. That's not massive news. We kind of all do that all the time. Inconsistency number one. Pretty much the most ill-trusted brand on the whole planet. Yet, despite that, we still tell them absolutely everything about what we do, where we are, where we live, who we're talking to, or who we love. And the reason why we do that is because, actually, the personal benefit of using the platform is bigger than the little trust we have for Facebook. Down here, we've got those people who scrape the internet for our email addresses and send us lots of spammy messages, like we saw in the video at the beginning. And, you know, that's always going to be remaining down there, and thank God GDPR is addressing those kind of organizations. But up here, this is where people like me sit. The NHS, academia, quite trusted brands. In fact, the NHS is the most trusted brand in the country. But for many of us, we don't understand how us walking into a GP practice will benefit anyone. And in which case, why do it? So many of us might not know what sort of work exists out there. So pluck a couple of examples out. It's not necessarily sexy AI, but it's the stuff that gets real people moving and real practice changing. So let's take an example. In Wales, in Swansea University, they found that GPs were over-prescribing antidepressants to teenagers. It was above average prescription, and they found this out by just observing the GP data. They went in there and started working with GPs to understand why it is their prescribing patterns were above normal. How about when Nuneaton Hospital, they found that they had above average asthma incidents. And so what they did is they targeted and stratified particular small children who came that were at high risk of having an asthma attack. And as a result, slashed the number of children who died of preventable asthma attacks. What about Cancer Research UK? They used cancer research registries and found that black African women were twice as likely to be diagnosed with late stage breast cancer. Now, they're quite sort of descriptive facts there, but we would never know any of these things unless we started looking at the data. So thank you so much for taking part in the world's biggest clinical trial, which is life. What's not so awesome is that none of you know you're in it. So it's like giving blood, but you don't get the needles and you don't get the excuse to drink lots and lots of squash. But also, you don't even get the warm fuzzies and the moral high ground to be like, yeah, I don't need blood today. What did you do? So how do we need to change this discussion? Well, not, we can't do incredible AI, incredible machine learning. We can't do all this big data stuff if we don't have the raw materials, if we don't have the data. And if we really want to change the discussion and reap the benefit of all this awesome technology, we've got to start telling the right stories. And up until this point, we've done a really good job of the bad stories. How we tell the stories, how much we tell, and also what we tell. So how we tell. 2013 was kind of the Cambridge Analytica moment, but for the health tech scene, it was a, it was a bad year for us. There was an initiative called Care.Data, which was basically the NHS's attempt to pool all the data we had in the UK into one big pot. You might think this happens already. No, it doesn't. It would be the single most incredible thing for health research in the UK. And they thought, well, how are we going to tell the public about this one? We'll put it in leaflets. So they disseminated a bunch of leaflets to the country, talking to people about what risks and benefits, harms, and any extra information there might be about what this might mean for them. Funnily enough, lots of people didn't read the leaflet, and let alone received it. And so when people started catching wind of the fact that everyone's data was being linked and it could potentially be sold to pharmaceutical companies for research, understandably, people started to get a bit worried. Several years later, after several iterations, this whole program got pulled. The significance of this is it has put the UK back decades when it comes to health research. We're basically in line with the Americans now. Terrible. Another one is about how much information you tell people. So another distillation diagram. One is how anxious you are. And two is how much knowledge you have. And this is kind of a graph again about your willingness to share data. And let's presume that acquiring knowledge takes a fair amount of time. <laughs> So if you're right at the bottom, in the bottom left-hand corner, you're not very anxious when you don't know anything. You're living in blissful ignorance. Most people know a little bit, though. 
And it was found out that actually, the more you tell people about what happens with data, the information governance, the ethics, the processes, the more anxious they get. So before you know it, you're kind of balls deep in IG processes and you don't know what you're doing and you're basically so anxious you're completely paralyzed. But then there's a moment where all the pennies drop and actually you realize, hey, I, I get the benefits of data sharing. I get that by me sharing my data with people, others can benefit. And these are my risks and these are the benefits. I, I get it. Unfortunately, it was thought that this whole curve takes about two weeks. We don't have two weeks of teaching those really boring topics when it comes to data science. So what, how can we get over this, this kind of barrier of knowledge? Thirdly, it's what we tell. So many of us will see these sorts of headlines not infrequently. You know, big tech companies building partnerships, potentially slightly dodgy with the NHS, or big cybersecurity breaches where potentially millions of patient data is lost. Doesn't do great for public confidence, does it? But those are really attractive headlines. You know, it is meaty apocalyptic sentences here. It's not, you know, Bernadette shared her data and Jerry's now alive as a result. <laughs> so what stories do we tell? Let's so go back to my examples. It, it's, it's not that Nan Eaton's got above average asthma incidents. It's that that child didn't die because they had a process in place based on that data. It's the story that a black woman, in fact, hundreds of black women, can now receive life-changing chemotherapy because it was identified that there was a disparity between ethnicities in breast cancer detection. Or it was that little girl who was able to sit her GCSEs because she wasn't suffering from awful side effects of too many antidepressants. Those are the stories. What about a story of a lady who devoted her whole life to public service? And then, over time, she started to find herself struggling with words and tripping over her sentences. And before she knew it, she was sitting in front of a doctor, and he was telling her that she had late-stage brain cancer. Dame Tessa Jowell died a few weeks ago, but she did not die quietly. She died with an absolute roar. And she said, it is my hope that through my cancer journey and sharing of my data, we'll be able to develop better treatments for cancer and speed up the discovery of new ones. She didn't talk statistics. She didn't talk numbers. She talked about her personal experience and her pledge for the common good to share data. Because of that story that gets you right here, she absolutely shifted the needle in this whole discussion. Brain and cancer research has been going on for decades, but in the past couple of weeks, there's been a 40 million pound fund allocated to brain, further brain cancer research. There's been a new cancer registry set up so people could donate their data to it. We've never seen so much change happen because of one person. And why is that? Because she told a personal story. So when you go into the hospital or the doctor, you experience something. You're having a terrible time. You're going to see a medical professional. And that experience is a story, it's a journey, it's got emotions around it. That's also just information, and information is just data. It is all the same thing, but words do matter. The perception does matter. And as data gets bigger and bigger, we talk more and more about all these complex algorithms. We seem to lose those on the ground, important, slightly emotional human stories. We are very lucky in the UK. We have the power to change who can access our data, when they can access it, and under what circumstances they can access it. Many countries don't have that luxury. But with that power, you have a huge amount of responsibility to not look at people like me and think, you're basically just Mark Zuckerberg's twin. We are good, there are good data scientists out there who do try and do good research. So what's my plea to people? To the media out there, read The Fox and the Turkey. It's one of Aesop's best ones. By too much attention to danger, we may fall victims to it. If you constantly publish really dramatic, misrepresentative stories about access to data, you are swaying public knowledge about what's happening. So if you want an apocalyptic headline, how about you investigate how many lives have been lost from not sharing data as a result of those negative headlines. 
The data scientists read the crab and its mother. Sure, you can talk about your AUCs all night long. Basically, very few people are going to care. But talk to the patients whose data you're using. Find out why they've given their data, what, what questions they want answered, what analyses they want run, what important research matters to them. And to you, read the line in the three bulls. In union, there is strength. Data is like a grain of sand. By itself, it's not immensely useful. But you put it together, and you get an incredible beach upon which hundreds, if not thousands, of people can reap the reward. So thank you, I think, is what I have to say. Thank you for the privilege and luxury of you exposing your most vulnerable, sensitive moments. I always access the data securely and safely. I don't know your name. I don't know where you live. I don't know where you're from, but I do know what date you got cancer. I do know that you became depressed after that miscarriage. And I do know that your son died of an asthma attack. So thank you for sharing that journey with me. Because without you sharing that journey, I can't, share, I can't link it to all these other journeys. And so that people like you down the line, future generations, your neighbors, your friends, who knows? But people like you don't have to suffer like you did. In a world that is so dependent now on data and tech, let's not use the human stories, because those are the things that shift the needle of culture. I'm just sorry that more nerds and techies like me never tell that story. Thank you.